Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for this webinar about Namibia's energy sector. My name is Thomas Headley. I'm an editor with Africa Oil and Power. Today, we'll be talking about the future of the Namibia's uh, energy sector uh, during this webinar brought to you by the African Energy Chamber and Africa Oil and Power. Our co-moderator today is uh, Javi Kanjemba. Javi is a lawyer spe specialized in the energy sector. He's been with uh, several uh, African law firms and the International Energy Agency, among others. Uh, before we kick off, I'd like to go through a couple of housekeeping rules for the session today. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, a few buttons. Uh, the chat box is there for you to chat amongst yourselves. You are hundreds of you connected today with us. So um, if you feel like sparking a discussion on there, please, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, I'd like to start off because uh, let's try and make this session as interactive as possible. If you could start by stating uh, from where you're connecting, from which country you're connecting, so we can see uh, how far we are reaching. Please don't ask any questions in this uh, chat box. We have a dedica dedicated box for this, which is the Q&A box on the right. Uh, Javi and myself will be managing the Q&A box, so um, we'll try and submit as many questions as possible to our panelists uh, from the ones you submit in that Q&A box. Um, His Excellency and NJ are welcoming the media to this session, so if you are a participant in the media, please virtually raise your hand. You have also a button for that in the bottom toolbar. Raise your hand and uh, someone from the AOP team will accommodate you and include you in the end of the discussion to submit your question. Um, thanks uh, so much for joining. This session is going to be recorded, is currently recorded and will be available at the end of the session on YouTube. Um, and that's it, yeah. Thank you so much for joining and I'll pass it on to Javi to introduce our panelists. Mm. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, um, and I believe you are joining us from Paris, is that right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, well, welcome to um, this seminar, or uh, this uh, webinar, rather. Um, 2020 was planned to be a strong year for the exploratory and drilling industry. Uh, we have seen oil industries being hit hard by COVID-19 pandemic. Oil majors have taken uh, different strategies on how to, they're going to weather this storm. Renewables have been impacted also in this, in this crisis. But how exactly um, does the future of the Namibian energy industry look like? Uh, will things look uh, the way they were in the past? We want to go back to the, thing, the, to the way the things were in the past. You know, if not, um, how do we want the future to look like? Today, we are joined, of course, by um, Honorable Minister Alwendo and NJ Ayuk, uh, where we attempt to fill some holes in answering these questions. Uh, by that, we're going to have a conversation that will look at the state of the country's um, upstream industry and its development potential in the context of the current global mark, uh, climate, uh, and discuss the country's key energy infrastructure and power projects in light of Namibia's push to develop a sustainable, clean energy industry. Um, but to give you a background on why these two speakers have deserve or have authority on the subjects, let me introduce them. Right, so Honorable Tom Alwendo, a true uh, son of the soil, in, uh, for Namibia at least, started his career as, uh, with the central bank where he started off as a deputy governor and later appointed as a governor of the Bank of Namibia. After his long career at the central bank, he was appointed as director of the National Planning Commission um, with the aim of mapping out and planning, prioritizing and directing national development. He was later appointed as Minister of Economic Planning and Director of the National Planning Commission. In 2018, he took on the hot seat as the gatekeeper of Namibia's new, uh, natural uh, resource, or, or as the gatekeeper of Namibia's natural resources as a Minister of Mines and Energy, a post he was recently reappointed to. In this role, he prioritized, his, his priorities are to create a conducive in, uh, investment environment in both the mining and energy sector with the, aim of, with the main aim of pro progressing Namibia's social economic development. He holds a BCom from Witwatersstra uh, and an MBA from University of Wales. A, a pragmatic uh, individual, result in, uh, driven, and an advocate for youth empowerment and skills development. Uh, he joins us from the, head, uh, the main office in Ventuk, Namibia. Uh, good afternoon, Minister, Honourable Minister. 
Thank you very much, uh, Harvey. And I think for this purpose, now you can call me Tom. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom. And all of you can actually call me Tom. <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you very much for the uh, interview. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, then we have NJ Ayuk. Well, NJ is a true Pan-African, right? And a go-getter as, as far as I know him, right? A leading authority in the African energy sector and a strong advocate of African entrepreneurship. NJ started uh, his career serving tables in Germany, I believe at the age of 16, right? Uh, he's a, a currently the managing partner of Centurion Group, a Pan-African corporate conglomerate specializing in energy, um, extractive industries in the financial sector. The firm has scaled up um, unimaginable growth and development in the course of recent years and further ensured its global outreach in countries like its Equatorial Guinea, Ghana, Cameroon, and Mauritius, hopefully soon Namibia. He is the current chairman of the African um, Energy Chambers and a progressive business, a progressive ne business network that promotes business and investment opportunities within the continent by connecting local corporations, foreign investors, and ministerial parties. A fitting position for him as an individual and for him as a, uh, an entity for this webinar specifically. He's also the author of Billions at Play, um, A Future of Africa Energy and Doing Deals. He earned his degree in government and politics from the University of Maryland Co College, College Park, a Juris Doctor at the law, uh, in law at the Williams Mitchell College in, of Law uh, later, and later an MBA at the New York Institute of Technology a strong advocate in promoting and enabling environment for investment in the energy space, a cutthroat mentor in skills development, and a passionate Afri uh, advocate in African, uh, African interest. But disappointingly, he has not yet bathed himself under the Namibian sun. Um, I think he, he needs for over 18 years, so he should come back to Namibia and just do that. He's joining us from the headquarters of the African Energy Chambers in Johannesburg, South Africa. Good afternoon, AJ. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Mm. So I think we're going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with you, AJ. Well, the global oil and gas industry is experiencing a crisis never witnessed before, right? And with a drop of global energy demand from COVID-19, pushing oil prices to a new low, how do you see OPEC, the OPEC plus deal and com combined with the efforts from G20 Right, the one that we're operating with, bringing a supply and demand alignment. What, what further global action, if any, do you believe is needed to address this, uh, or the oil market? Um, thank you for having me, and uh, it's an honor to get to be on this uh, platform with the Honorable Minister. And uh, Minister, it's, uh, we are always well um, received and entertained when we deal with members from your country and I think that hospitality is shown by your presence here. I also believe that looking at um, the OPEC deal, we have to give credit to OPEC and non-OPEC countries and as you say, the G20 countries for what we need with having a global supply cut. You have to look at where we were you had an over demand in the market towards basically, you know, if I have to explain to my grandmother, there was too much oil in the market. And then you had a virus in the air and then the virus really hit and there was just um, demand, demand factors were just not helping. So I think credit should be given to OPEC and non-OPEC countries for them bringing the entire world together and really dealing with the issue, but also it also speaks into net importers like Namibia and to look at what everyday Namibians want and also looking at seeing how we can create more stability in the market because you know uncertainty really brings really makes it um, difficult for anybody to plan whether it is upstream midstream or downstream but looking at where we stand today in the market you there is likely going to be need for OPEC to continue the cuts beyond June. It is going to be something that's going, you're going to see in OPEC discussions coming in next month that the cuts might have to be deeper. We saw from yesterday, Saudi Arabia announced 1 million extra barriers of cuts that it did voluntarily. The United Arab Emirates did the same and some other OPEC countries are doing the same. 
and just to see that the, the, the market does stabilizes. And I think that would also help in really raising expectations and creating more decision in uh, upstream um, projects in uh, Namibia and other African countries around the region. Hmm. No, th thank you for that, NJ. Um, now I'll, I'll like to go back to the ministers. So as a non-producing country, right, um, Namibia, that is, um, and, and a non-OPEC member, what is Namibia's role in this international conversation? How do we ensure that Namibia has a, a seat at the table as, a global, as global strategies combat the crisis and develop into the future? Honorable Minister, or Tom, sorry. Well, th thank you very much again. I, uh, let me also just uh, thank all the participants uh, who, who are taking part in this very important discussion. Uh, and to you, NJ, maybe just to appreciate the uh, African Charter, you know, the, the, the Energy Charter, you know, the, the, the work you guys are doing. Uh, obviously, we know uh, that energy will continue to be one of the most important building block in the uh, reconstruction of the African economies and therefore the, the work you guys are doing is very, very important. And without energy, we can't really do much. Uh, yes, obviously we, we as Namibia, um, we are, as you say, we are a non-producing country. We don't produce, we consume. Uh, and therefore the, the role we, we can play is not so much really at, at, at that level where the OPEC uh, will, will play that role. Mm. Uh, but obviously, the, as, as, the, as the Namibian landscape, um, maybe just to say that right now, in terms of our energy need, um, we obtain almost 90% of our energy from renewables. Uh, and that sounds like a, quite a high figure, and that's simply because I think in, in, in that figure we include uh, hydro, and if you take out hydro, you know, that drops to about 30%. Um, and when it comes to the hydrocarbons, uh, which is now the, what you're talking about, where the other people are concentrating on the, 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 the upstream, uh, Namibia is a relatively newcomer to this. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a discovery. We, don't, uh, we have never had a discovery before. Uh, over the last uh, couple of years, there, there are some you know, majors that has been um, doing prospecting in, 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 in our uh, sectors. And I think the, the prospect of us really becoming a player uh, in, in the upstream, that prospect is already growing by the day uh, to the extent that now we have a couple of some of the major companies, uh, oil companies that are uh, doing exploration. And therefore, when that time comes, when we actually find, you have a, find, you know, a finding, uh, certainly I think we uh, hopefully will not just be a consumer um, but also just a producer. But even as a consumer, as small as we are, of course, consumers have a role to play as well. It's true, I think with the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, consumption of energy has come down. Uh, and therefore, it, the, the role consu consuming countries can really play is just to say, how quickly can we get the economy back on the street? How quickly can we ramp up the consumption of energy again? Um, and I know a number of countries are starting slowly but surely reopening the economies. And I think that happens then. I think consumption hopefully uh, will come up again. Uh, and that will just make it easier for the, for the energy sector. Mm. Mm. No, thank you, uh, Tom. Um, um, I would still like to s stick with you specifically. Uh, but what is Namibia's role in the global discussion on oil and gas? Uh, how do you plan on en engaging with your fellow African ministers, uh, ministers of energy, of course, um, around, the, uh, around the issue of energy security and how we go forward in, under yeah. in directing, in coming up with a plan on how to ensure that Africa has energy security, it's secure when it comes to energy. Excuse me, sorry for that. Yeah. Um, I think there's, there are a number of platforms, I think, that we um, on the continent are using. Uh, as you know, 
within the continent, we have got uh, regional development blocks, and we also got and at the uh, APEC level with the Union, uh, African Union. Mm. There are platforms where we all meet as ministers, not only for the energy sector, but all the other, you know, various sectors where ministers uh, will meet and then actually say, look, you know, the, like in energy, we say, look, uh, if you are going to have Agenda 2063 being realized, one of the things we need to do is actually, you know, the, um, uh, the energy and therefore the um, uh, security of supply for energy. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that platform, so one of the most important things that we discuss um, is to say we need to have, in a way, um, maybe not uniform, but you need to have similar environments if you are going to attract investors to come and therefore, what sort of things that, what sort of uh, legal frameworks, for example, do we need to have in place in such a way that at least, you know, the um, we do not differ too much in terms of how we manage the situation or how we attract investors. And therefore those platforms continue. Um, and they are very, very serving a very, very important um, uh, purpose, especially as I say in some of the African countries really, I mean, the, uh, in the issue of energy is really, really still uh, at a very nascent uh, kind of levels. And therefore uh, through those platforms, we continue to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we also know now that I think increasingly you have got a number of African countries uh, that have discovered um, uh, oil and they continue to discover oil. And therefore, because of the prior discussion and platforms that have served actually for us to have a common understanding of how to deal with these natural resources, uh, I think they are in a better position now, now that they actually have discovered it to make sure at least that it's not, um, the resources are exploited in a very sustainable manner. Mm. Mm. Yeah, th th that's, I think that's a fair answer. I would like to go to NJ specifically. Uh, we see um, economists around the world are facing an unprecedented um, challenge against COVID-19, the, the pandemic, right? And African economists are projected to particularly be hit hard. What do you see as the outlook for Namibia and Africa and how are African, how can African countries cooperate to mitigate the economic impacts already being felt? Additionally, what international action, if any, do you believe is needed to preserve Africa's economic progress of the last decade? Um, I think you've already seen a big shift with African economies and Namibia included. And what you look at right now, you're looking at a lot of uh, projects that were they're going to be delayed. I, some people like to talk down on Africa and say these projects are going to be canceled. I've not heard of projects that are going to be canceled, whether it's drilling projects, whether it's midstream projects, they're just going to be delayed because of the conditions. Like even if you have the money right now, we are on a webinar, you can't, you can't fly anywhere because most, of, most countries are on lockdowns and you, you, there, there are going to be new restrictions that we have to do before we engage in um, um, one another. Some people say no more hugging and no more kissing. I don't know how that is possible, but we will see. And when you look at um, a lot of energy projects that you're going to look around the continent, it, it's time where you require some um, government intervention, some real action. And it's not just government intervention when it comes into providing money and all, all of that. No, governments have their own priorities and other um, big issues that they're dealing with. But it's concerning to see how we create a bigger, more of an enabling environment to really see how we can enable maybe new drillers, new people investing in new projects, whether it is renewables, whether it is oil and gas, so that these capital inflows and these um, FIDs can continue coming in. There is, you cannot just say a one Africa strategy fits all. It is very complex. You have the Africa Free Trade Act that already lays down a platform when it comes into um, doing business and, 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 and uh, going to open up a billion, a billion person market on how going to do, um, on how um, business is going to be done around the continent. But we have to take um, advantage of that as Africans and also as investors. But also you have to start looking at what you do in sh on a short term. And on a short term, you have to look at maybe considering how to look at these licenses. For example, if I am a, 
if I am a petroleum um, exploration company do, um, doing business in Namibia right now, I'll be going to the minister and say, Mr. Minister, this year is a year that is going to be very, very tough. I plan to drill maybe two, three wells in, let's say, May, June, July, or, or, um, or something like that. It's going to be tough with me, um, for me to be, be able to do that, looking at the market conditions right now and also the health conditions. I would want to engage with the minister and have a conversation with him to say, we're not stopping, we're not um, backing out, but we probably would need some extensions because we need to reschedule these dates and let's have a conversation on how to move to, to move on that. So it goes with both sides. So you have, to, you have to engage that. But also it's time for us to really look at, really having that conversation with government to see how do we incentivize growth? How do we look at some of these projects that we've looked at and really have a big African thinking and say, it, it's not just maybe government or um, ministry talking to us, but we talking to one another and saying, what do you want and what do I want so that we can pick up some of these projects going so that to really ensure that it benefits our people, create more jobs, create more opportunities, create local content and local empowerment. So there is not a one strategy that fits for all. I think there is that there must be an open feel or an open dialogue that, and um, both of us listening to one another that can really create and spur growth from the beginning. But also we got to be very, we got to also think about one thing. It's a long-term play. You know, most people look at this and just think this is going to be done in a short term. It's a long-term play. You have to have vision, you have to have strategy, and you got to be patient and not wait and drive a very panic-driven um, strategy and say, oh my God, everything is burning down and let's go. So you be patient and that also comes with capital. Even when you look at the kind of capital that has to be come, Namibia right now, and even in the future, it's not just going to need capital, but it's going to need pressure capital. Capital that works with entrepreneurs and, and works with government to say, it's going to take some time for us to get this realization, these projects happening, but government also has to meet those investors um, meet, um, uh, midway to ensure that this happens. So it, it's a game of both sides. Hmm. Yeah, and, Jay, uh, and I understand that, and, and I think that's a, um, an excellent answer. But however, I, I would like to, yeah, right now, as you excellently said, uh, we, uh, the market is, is burning down, right? So what exactly should happen in the market so that we put the fire out? Well, if, if you should speak from a Namibian perspective, or uh, looking at a country like Namibia, as the Honorable Minister said, you're looking at a country that is net, a net importer. Mm -hmm. If you're an importer of, uh, of crude oil, of course the voice of consumers have to, be, have, have to be taken into consideration when it comes into OPEC discussions, of which I've been lucky to be part of a lot of them, and in really trying to see how you stabilize the market. So that is that you have to take, you have to pay attention to that voice, but you've got to also look at a regional block and really say, where do you sit right now on more specifics? Whether it is looking at developing gas and, and, and gas plants and, and everything, trying to show up your manufacturing basis so you can create more jobs. So you could, you could look at that. You could go into specifics on saying, you know, is this time to look at maybe tax incentives or all of that? It is very, very difficult to put that right out, out there right now. We at the chamber do have some ideas which we kind of, it's not mandatory, it's advisory. We kind of laid out there where we, where we urge governments, for example, to say, maybe you should consider looking at entrepreneurs, local companies and say, mm -hmm. waive fees or extending some time for them to act. Maybe it's time to look at other issues on fiscal issues to attract more dollars in, 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 into it. The issue you're seeing right now, and it's not just Namibia, all around the world, in the past, we in Africa used to just think Nigeria, Angola, um, Gabon on oil and gas. Right now, Namibia has a massive potential to discover huge amounts of gas, use a huge amount of, of, of petroleum. You just need one discovery, and you're going to see everybody chasing down on what is in Namibia, and it's going to happen 
very, very soon. But Namibia is not just competing right now to get those dollars from Nigeria or Angola or anything. It's competing with Guyana, which nobody ever thought Guyana would have big, big discoveries. Guyana is going to be producing about 400,000 barrels a day. It's looking, you, you're trying to attract those same dollars that are going to Mozambique, which just had big gas discoveries. They're going to be seeing a lot of LNG development. Tanzania or Senegal. So the potential is out there, but the competition for dollars is very, very steep. And in, a, in, an, in an era of climate change, you even see limited, limited dollars going into fossil fuels. So you got to be more attractive. You got to find more ways, but you also got to be balanced and really trying to show up your people. So it's a delicate balance we're walking in, but you need to show up and get that first discovery and develop it and have it done. And you know, people like us in the private sector, we're going to be challenging the minister to say, please get that kudu gas working so that we can start turning the story and making this happen for everybody. Mm. Okay. Let, uh, maybe just to say a few things about, you know, in, 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 uh, in response to what yes, you have said, uh, just a quick one. Um, I think if there's anything, if there's any lesson we would have learned from this COVID-19, it's the fact that you need to have a dialogue. Um, you, you, as, as, as a private sector, you know, or as a government or as whatever, you know, wherever you stand, you need to have that kind of a dialogue because what has happened is really something which nobody ever thought would happen. And therefore, if we are all going to start to react and act um, as a government or as a private sector without actually talking to the other, likely we are just going to prolong the problem and therefore the collaborations and the, uh, the, the dialogue we have spoken about is very, very important. Uh, for example, yes, I, I, I know because of the COVID-19, uh, some investors might start to think, well, if I was going to drill, I'm not so sure what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what OPEC is going to do. I don't know where this is going to go. And therefore, maybe I will not do something. But before that decision is taken or before that position is actually taken, it's always good then actually to uh, have that dialogue with the, uh, with the governments. Uh, right now, we do have about uh, six of the major companies that are actually exploring uh, in, uh, in our sectors. And uh, the, uh, before the COVID-19, uh, there they, they, they are plans that at least by the end of January, February next year, we're going to have at least about four wells that would have been drilled. Uh, now, during the COVID-19 or after the COVID-19, uh, well, maybe not after, we're still actually in the period, so we don't know where it's going to end. Uh, so far, we have not had any of the companies saying, oh, because of COVID-19, we are not going to go ahead. So, uh, but we have been having discussion to say, well, we are all watching the situation. We are actually engaging with each other. And obviously, uh, through that engagement, uh, as, as, the, uh, as the government, uh, we would want to, you know, to assist wherever we can to make sure at least that, you know, the plans are not derailed. Uh, for far too long, and that you know we still be able then to pick up you know where we left off you know uh, soon after the COVID nineteen had left. Uh, so so that that dialogue is very very important. And and earlier as we were saying you know there's so many dialogues you know the dialogues either maybe from the supplier side or from the demand side, uh, what OPEC does or what other consuming countries may do. But that th th those parties still need to get together because uh, um, even if we are not. Um, uh, a producer country and therefore we are not part of the direct discussion with the OPEC. Certainly, whatever they may decide will also have an impact on what investors in the some of this um, uh, project may wish to do. Uh, and therefore, we can still influence the situation where, where it ought to go in such a way that at least the, the industry, the global industry, uh, still uh, have a chance to, um, to, 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 to go forward uh, as if COVID-19 did not exist. So just again to say the, 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 the discussions and, and the dialogue you need to have between the investment communities uh, and, 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 the, and the government is very, very important. Uh, and we have done that. We are continuing to do that, not only in the uh, energy sector, but in so many other sectors um, since this period started. Honorable Minister, we're having a couple of questions coming in. Um, NJ touched on the, the situation of the Kudu gas field, which indeed represents a uh, huge potential in terms of um, in terms of gas to power, in terms of uh, re, um, 
decreasing uh, gas uh, imports. And uh, we, are, we have questions wondering, what is the stance of the government on this particular project? Uh, it's currently operated by BW Energy. Can we expect any movement in the next few months uh, on that particular project? The, 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 as you know, uh, Kudu as a project is something that has been coming a long way. Um, you know, the, we had, you know, investors, you know, who together with the government have been trying actually to develop that field. Um, and the last round of discussion with BW Kudu, we have heard um, a year and a half ago. Uh, again, we had a plan to proceed to do this. Uh, but it turned out that, you know, because of the other discoveries, you know, somewhere else in terms of gas to power, um, and it looks as if the, the, the development model that we then have started to talk with BW Kudu wasn't going to make it work. Uh, and therefore, we have agreed to say, well, maybe the, the kind of um, business model that we wanted to actually to utilize to actually develop this field if it's not going to be working, and, and the main reason why actually it was found to be a little bit difficult actually to proceed on that basis was the fact what was government required to put in um, as, as, as either capital or certain physical um, concession that government had to give. But unfortunately, given our situation, we weren't able to do that. And what we have agreed to do to say, look, you know, can we find another way of actually developing that field? Um, uh, another business model, not necessarily where the government is, is necessarily involved in that. And I think that's where we are. Um, we, we haven't had a formal uh, engagement as yet uh, since last year to actually to see how, how far did we get and can we actually take it off the ground. Uh, but certainly I think it's still um, a potential development that uh, can be carried out and the, the economic potential and economic benefit coming from that is actually immense and therefore as a government, we would still want to see that happening, uh, but we just need probably to come up with a different business model uh, than the one which was actually crafted earlier on. Thank you. Mm. No, th th thank you, um, Tom. Um, um, but I would like to st stick to you in this um, conversation. Or how has the Namibian, how has Namibia been impacted by the drop in oil prices, oil and gas prices? And how do you see uh, further exploration activities being impacted in this near and long, in this near and long term? So, yeah. Okay, well, the, 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 um, the near collapse of, of, of oil, obviously, you know, as we know, the, the, there was a time when the uh, oil price went into the negative, uh, such that producers just simply needed to get rid of their products. Uh, now, being a country that simply consume uh, refined products, so th that, 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 that collapse has not really directly, uh, and it will not to the same magnitude actually impacted on us. Obviously, uh, because of the, uh, of the uh, low price of crude, uh, mm -hmm. That has also have a, a, an impact on the refined product such that actually the price of refined product is coming, is coming down. And therefore, for us as a, as a consuming economy, it's, a, it's quite a positive thing. Uh, it's a positive that at least now, you know, the, the, um, we were able, for example, to, uh, I think for the last two couple of, uh, two, two, two months, we were able to lower the, um, the price of, of, of petrol and, and diesel. Uh, but we also know that, you know, at the same time, as much as the, uh, there was a positive impact on the, um, on the price itself, uh, we also have uh, the other side of the impact, which was actually through the exchange rate. As you know, uh, the Namibian dollar, US dollar exchange rate has actually almost deteriorated to the extent that the, 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 the impact on the, on the price and on the foreign exchange uh, rates kind of canceling each other out. But at least, you know, we are still able to benefit from a much from a lower uh, um, uh, uh, price of, um, of, of refined products. But in the long run, as I was saying, if, if then the, um, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic continues such that demand will continue to be um, uh, suppressed, not only in Namibia, but almost everywhere else, 
Uh, obviously, the, the fear is then that, you know, the, 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 the speed with which the companies that are doing exploration, we're going to start, for example, doing drilling, that might be pushed a little bit back, you know, uh, into the, in, in the future. Uh, and therefore, I think we're all just hoping that in the next couple of weeks, um, uh, the, there will be an improvement in, in the global pandemic, uh, as, as it were. Uh, luckily, I think for us in Namibia, we are quite still fortunate that, you know, the, in terms of the pandemic itself, so, uh, we are still not really that much um, adversely impacted. And we still got only 16 cases that has been actually be diagnosed. We still have, we don't have any deaths so, so far, unfortunately. Uh, and out of those 16, I think it's only about six that are still actually active cases. So. From that perspective, we, we, we are hopeful that at least the economy is likely to be able to open up much faster than maybe in other areas, and therefore uh, stimulating demand uh, from, from fuel uh, products again. Uh, but mm -hmm. certainly, I think if the global situation does not improve as quick as we all hope it should, uh, it might then have an effect whereby then it will slow down the pace with which I think the companies were supposed to then uh, proceed with their, some of their project development. Mm. So let me get back to NJ. NJ, are you still there? Of course. <laughs> um, the, the idea is to really, um, what future do you see for a country like Namibia? I mean, we are exploring, yes, that, that is fair, but we have a situation where um, we have issues of local content development. We have an issue of um, uh, acceding to uh, certain conventions, agreements, um, worldwide agreements where we can bind ourselves. So how do you think a country like Namibia, not producing, but consuming, how do you think a country like they should go forward in cementing itself if it does um, manage to discover oil or gas um, commercially, economic uh, oil and gas. How, how do you see that? How do you, what would you advise we should do in going forward if we do manage to discover oil or gas? NJ, on to you. I think you have to start planning right now. Don't wait until you, until you discover because whether you discover or not, which you will, those, um, those skills, when it comes into skills training, preparing your people, training a lot of young people to become part of the industry in the future, mm -hmm. that is what is going to see you through. We have always had a, a, um, a story around Africa that when oil is discovered, we abandon our fishing, we abandon our agriculture, we abandon everything. You already are blessed to have a balanced economy. Don't abandon that. But so oil should be, uh, it should be an enabler in taking your prosperity to a different level. And that's what you have to look at. But you have to start training young people right now. You have to start putting the right kind of things that work within the economy. For example, it, you know, it took Norway about 30 to 40 years to create, um, 30 years to create a sovereign wealth fund when um, um, after they've been producing oil. Ghana did it in 45 days. And there's no reason why if Namibia cannot start getting um, the right kind of uh, um, platforms in place, that sh um, should that really great event happen, you would be ready to move on that. You have to see with, with the discovery comes with a lot of new kind of um, 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 issues when it comes into building local capacity, getting Namibians to be able to provide the kind of uh, support into that in, um, into the oil into the oil industry, getting women involved in in, in being a, an intrinsic part of of, of uh, the oil and gas industry. So don't wait till that happens and then you start fast tracking with new regulations and new legislations to move um, fast at that time, because I always say integration without preparation is frustration. So you are going to push local content, but there has to be some context in the local content. You have to still create that wealthy and healthy balance in letting the international um, companies or the, the, the producers be able to develop the, the asset, 
bring get to first oil while also making sure that you empower people around. There is a lot of stories around Africa to look, to see what not to do and what to do. And you could, and you know, I always say sometimes it's better to focus on what not to do because that would, have, that would prevent you from getting in trouble. But some of the good things also you've seen around Africa that has happened. And also you, you have to also, but again, the key thing here is going to be entrepreneurship. It's not going to be, you know, I come from the private sector and I think one of the mistakes we make from the private sector is always looking at the minister and saying, minister, you haven't given me a job. Or minister, you haven't forced the company to give me an opportunity. Or minister, you haven't told them to hire me. That's not enough. And that's not the minister's job. I don't want the minister coming into my business telling me to hire somebody or telling me to, to sign the contract for, this, um, for anybody. I think that's our job in the private sector. That's the job of every Namibian to say, I want to get my company ready. I want to engage their explorers. I want to discuss with them what, is their, what are their future plans. How, do, how can my business or my company shape itself to move in there? And then if I have this conversation like we have with the Honorable Minister, we want to be able to say, here are the enablers that you can do to enable me as a local company and also as an international company. But don't wait on the government to create that opportunity for you. It's up to us, especially young people, to go out there, engage these companies and say, here we are, we can, we can, we, we, here's what we can do, what skills do you need, what do I prepare myself when this glorious event, um, event happen, I should be ready. I think that's what you need to be focused on. Yes, government has its role to play, but from a private sector perspective, I think we have to do more. Don't wait for government to do everything for you. For you. Get yourself ready, then go push government. Mm. Mm. Uh, that, that's excellent. Um, we have Thomas on the line also, who's also one of our core moderators. I think the minister has a comment. What questions do we have? I, I, Javi, I, I wanted to say just something quickly, if, if, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, and that was, you know, I, I don't want you to ask you know, NJ about what should Namibia do. You should ask me that. I mean, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> Um, I, I, I would just supplement on some of the things you've said. Uh, I think really th there is a benefit, you know, when you are the latecomer. Uh, it can be beneficial to us as a, as a latecomer uh, in terms of the uh, upstream in, in the oil and gas. Um, such then that, you know, by the time a discovery is made, uh, and as I said, we have got all this network on the continent that we've been actually dealing with and people who have experience already, the Ghana, the Mozambique, everybody else has gone through this. And we've got these conversations. Surely I think we are we'll be in a better position to do what is right and also probably to avoid some of the pitfalls that they might have to go through because they were like, you know, they were the first, you know, uh, doing all these things. So I read in terms of really what we are like to do and how it may impact on, on us. I think we, we should pro we'll probably be in a better position in terms of the preparedness, uh, how to deal with the sector. Uh, it's true, I mean, there's always this thing about, you know, this, this some of the sectors, you, you know, it become a case rather than, you know, what people say. It doesn't have to be that. Uh, in, in terms of, I uh, think, preparation, I think we are certainly got all, you know, in terms of skills development, in terms of, you know, the kind of, um, production agreement one can have in terms of the local content. All those are things already actually we are discussing. Uh, and therefore, we should not really be in a position where we are not frantically not trying either not to look at the legislations or some of the things. Certainly, I think it will be in a better position, I think, than other countries. Simply, we're learning from what they've done. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Tom. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in from the audience. Um, I would like to touch on a new project that was um, that was announced uh, during the Namibia Economic Growth Summit last year for a 30, 37,500 barrel per day barge mounted refinery in Walvis Bay um, was announced by Mega North Holdings. Um, we are wondering what is the current status of the refinery, is there plans ahead for the, the building of a refinery in Namibia? Yeah. Um, I, I do remember, I think that was last year, I think in July when we have the mm. economic summit and I know some investors who made that announcement. Uh, 
Unfortunately, up to now, we haven't had really had much from the investors to say this is what it is they intend to do. And I think some of, one of the most, most difficult uh, things, I think, in terms of investing in the refinery, obviously, it's always like the supply of crude. Where are you going to get your supply? Uh, and obviously, people also then say, okay, well, what, what kind of market are you going to have? Uh, and, and those two issues, those two areas, if, if they aren't really finalized, you know, it always become difficult for the investors to proceed with that kind of investment. Um, but yes, I'm aware that they are still saying, you know, the investors are still saying, you know, they, they, they are putting a package together. Uh, and we hope that the sooner they finalize putting that together, then we can have the discussion with us as a government uh, to see where potentially can we assist. Uh, but I think, as I say earlier on, there were also people who wanted to do the, to, do, to do invest in the refinery. But the, the the issues they came around up with is just the fact that you know they ca they can't always have guarantee of supply of the crude. Unfortunately, uh, of course, Namibia not being a producer of crude, obviously there's no way we could guarantee them to have crude. Uh, but we know there's international market for crude. But somehow, uh, investors uh, tend to struggle. I think with that kind of uh, um, of supply. I have a, a follow-up question uh, also from the audience. Um, it's about the ease of doing business in Namibia. And of course that translates to attracting uh, more and more investors. How will the government ensure that investors are protected from the political economy that can discourage business in Namibia? Um, I, think, I think probably Namibia is probably, you know, one uh, of the most, um, uh, what we're going to use progressive in terms of uh, attracting um, uh, investors. Uh, not only do we do everything to attract investors, but you also actually do everything actually to retain them. I know most investors, they always fear, especially in this kind of sectors, where it's a long term. You don't want to come and invest in the year five or year 10. Suddenly, you know, things have changed such that it makes the investment non-profitable. Uh, so we are quite aware of that, and therefore, uh, in, in our engagement with, with the investors, uh, we have got an understanding that um, we, we have to negotiate in such a way that at least we have a win-win situation. Uh, there are times, obviously, governments, you know, uh, we, we sometimes do get it wrong. Uh, not intentionally, but there are times, sometimes, you know, you really come up with a place that you may actually turn out uh, unintentionally, actually not very good for businesses. But at least what we have in our favor is the fact that we are forever willing as a government to listen to the investors. Uh, and there are instances where we had to go back on some of the policies that we might have adopted uh, and maybe not having good um, understanding between the government and the private sector investors. Uh, and therefore in those instances, we were able actually to go back and review some of the policies. Uh, and therefore we, we are a listening uh, uh, government and therefore where it matters uh, where it's really mutually beneficial, we're always prepared actually to do that. Thank you, Minister. Mm. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and thank you for the que from the questions from um, the audience. Um, we have people joining from Cameroon. We have people joining from Kenya, uh, Germany, China. Even I've seen. Um, but I, I would like to direct the question to NJ, and this is going to fire you up a bit. But yes. Um, um, I'd like to touch on the issue of sustainability and the environment. Um, specifically, we have um, a situation where the world has decided to, to direct its attention to a political agenda of sustainable development, of um, a transition to renewable energy. And we we'll still have, in your capacity, of course, as the chairman of the and then um, the African Energy Charter, who's proponing for a future that still looks at fossil fuels. So my question to you specifically is, how do you reconcile the whole idea of investing in re fossil fuels with the Paris Agreement and uh, a transition in uh, energy production? Let's go with that. I think you, there is no reconciliation um, on this issue. I think oil and gas is going to be around for a long time. Exactly. To be part of the energy mix. 
the same as hydro, the same as renewables. We have a position of not taking out any source of energy. Mm -hmm. We must also be very, very environmentally friendly and lowering carbon emissions should be a key priority of anybody. I think mm -hmm. we have a moral obligation to leave this planet Earth better than we met it, and we gotta be good stewards of the environment. But we have to also look at where we stand, whether you live in Namibia, or whether you live in Gabon, or you live in Morocco, or in Dakar. As Africans, we have to look at what priorities lie in front of us. I used to, when I was uh, 21, I did my first visit to Namibia and I, I was really broke at that time. I stayed in a, a place yeah. called Kultura. And I, yeah. after two weeks of, uh, of being in Tura, I, I lost all my money, but I had so much fun. And then I went back to school. I think I became a better student after that. But I think those, those kids in Tura whom I hung out with, uh, I'm a little old right now, about um, 20 years ago, don't need a PhD thesis or an Oxford or Kennedy School of Government analysis why they didn't have food or why they don't have lights. This, uh, or if they have lights, the lights get, um, go off anything. They will be looking to the minister and say, Honorable um, Tom, why are my lights not on? And why can I not um, um, have a job? And why can we not have um, um, sustainable electricity? We're looking at a continent, and this is bigger than Namibia, where 650 million people have no access to any kind of power. And the other 200 um, to 300 million Africans who have access to any kind of electricity, that is not stable. It, 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 and it's not even enough to power manufacturing bases create industry, and really create jobs. So here we are today, we find ourselves, we have not polluted 17 times that of China, 15 times that of Europe or any other thing, and you don't blame Western nations for that, but also we should not be deprived of a time where the minister can have the right kind of energy to power his country, build manufacturing bases, and develop the economy to meet the aspirations of all our people. Energy poverty is real. And as much as we can look at that, just being able to turn the industry away and say, this industry is bad and evil, and let's not focus on that. We, it's, it's a position that we take a firm position on, on and say, we want to, I want to look out for those kids in Tura that help me spend all my money and make sure that they have jobs and they have a future. And that is our position. I think someone living in most of our very beautiful Western countries, they've done good for themselves and we should appreciate that and we should support them. But we also have to look at how they have to understand where we sit and our challenges and work with us to ensure that we can also meet those sustainable development. That is not going to be met by aid packages. It's going to be met by real development initiatives that, can, that are built from bottom up, from kids who can one day move from rags to riches. And that is a position that we maintain. Mm. And, and I, I tend to agree with you, NJ, in, in, in that we have a situation where uh, one part of the world is privileged enough to, under, to uh, forgo the idea of exploiting, if I can use that word, um, its um, fossil fuels resources. But on the other side, we have countries that are, uh, who have these resources and are, that's their primary source of one income and energy in terms of, in providing the needs of the nations. But I'd like to go to, um, to Tom and ask exactly, what is Namibia's strategy in going forward? What, what is the economic case um, 
in renewable energy versus fossil fuels and uh, where are we likely to go? Are we guided by the economic chase or are we guided by the political agenda? Honorable Tom, sorry. Tom, that is your question. Um, uh, thank you once again. NJ, you were in Namibia when you were 21 and you were broke, you said. So now, right now, you don't look like you are broke. So <laughs> please do come back. Um, and Katutura is no longer the same as it was 21, so 21 years ago. But, but we want you to come back and spend some money here. Uh, I would come. <laughs> yeah. But to do with regard to the environment, I don't really think it should be a case of one or the other. It's not, it should not be like, I'm simply going to do this because I want to destroy the environment. Nobody should want to do that. Uh, and I agree with you that, you know, all of us should want to protect the, the environment. Because, you know, that's the future. If you're all going to destroy it, it's not going to happen. But there's also a caveat. Uh, such then that if I need to develop and I need to have energy, without energy, I'm not going to develop. And therefore, if I were to really rely on fossil to, to be able to develop, that might actually put me in a better position tomorrow to be able to save the environment. Otherwise, if, it, if I don't do that, I will forever not be in a position actually to save the environment or to protect the environment. So it, it, it should not really be an ideological argument about, you know, this is, this is uh, it, you know, save the environment, you know, I'm not gonna do this because I must save the environment or not just save the environment as if there are those who want to destroy the environment. I don't really think that's how we should actually approach the matters. And therefore I would agree with a view that says, if, if really uh, those countries that need to develop the, their, uh, their economies and they need to actually the energy to be able to do that and in their mix they need to have fossil fuel, I don't really see what's necessarily wrong with that. Uh, and my argument is really just to say it will put such countries in a better position tomorrow to be actually able to save the environment uh, than if they were not actually to be allowed to develop. So we, we need to strike the balance uh, as in, and in our case, I was, as I was saying earlier on, uh, we have got more renewable, I think, you know, a mix, but that should not actually uh, 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 pro prohibit us to say, if there's a very good economic sense or economic case to be made to say, look, we need to actually to do this uh, or to use fossil fuel in order for us to actually to develop uh, and therefore to be in a better position to deal with the environment issues. I really don't think we should ideologically simply say, no, we can't do that. Uh, but I do understand um, that, you know, in the long run, uh, I think the, 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 the fossil fuel industry, uh, the industry itself also needs to be able then to put in a position to, uh, to, 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 to do more in terms of uh, improving the technology such that, you know, the, the, the impact on the environment is not as it was, say, 20 years or 30 years ago. And I know that is happening. Uh, and therefore, I don't really think we should go out and simply discard the whole uh, industry simply to say because uh, it's going to destroy the environment. It can be made clean. Yes. And actually people are making that already, the technology are improving to make it clean. Uh, but the moment we have really ideological uh, kind of outlook to say, you know, we're only going to do that because of the environment. I think this might, it yeah. might just really be more, uh, not a good thing for some of the economies, especially on no. those on the other. No, that's great. Honorable Minister, before we, we, we head into the last part of today's conversation, I'd like you to touch on uh, one, um, could you guess, two, um, the oil storage, and three, the future of um, the energy sector, specifically the projects that we are working on in Namibia. Uh, what do you think that is? Could you guess the storage and the future of, for example, uh, projects like Baines? How, how, how are we going, how are you moving forward in that, as, as brief as you can? The Kudu guess, as I, as I said, that's a project that has been coming a long way, but unfortunately, you know, in, in, in the recent past, the, the business model that we presented us, uh, to us wasn't really workable. But we agreed to really look at that model and make it work better. Uh, where can be beneficial to, to, to the economy and, and that's what the government can do. And that's what we are doing. Uh, mm. We hope in, in the next couple of months, uh, if it wasn't because of the COVID-19 uh, 
but mm. then we would have, have some other rounds of discussion to see how can we fast track that other options of developing a new business model. Uh, with regard to the oil storage, uh, I know there has been a call to say, well, now that the oil price has gone down uh, dramatically, why can't we buy up you know, the oil and store the oil? Uh, but I need to make it clear that the oil storage which we, with the project that we have been building for the last you know, two years is not to store crude oil. This is actually the storage facility for refined products. Uh, and therefore, as I was earlier saying earlier, the price of um, of refined products more or less the same as it was before um, before the, uh, the the COVID nineteen. Especially when you look into uh, in our case, when you look at the exchange rate at which we're actually buying the the, the refined product, uh, and therefore it's, it's not necessarily true to say uh, we're going to now buy the oil and actually store in this storage. But of course, the oil storage is not finalized yet, unfortunately. Uh, we were due to finalize this, uh, uh, the project, you know, uh, March. Uh, but because um, of the COVID-19, uh, the contractor that was actually uh, doing the project, um, some of their experts, unfortunately, they were locked out of the country and therefore they weren't able actually to do, uh, to complete the project. Uh, in fact, in December, we were busy with the uh, final testing uh, to make sure at least the, the, the the storage is essentially, uh, it doesn't leak, it doesn't have the defects. Uh, we have done the the, the, the the testing with the water. We're going to start actually testing with the real product. But as I said, unfortunately, that has come to a standstill for a while. We are trying to figure out uh, if, if the pandemic is going to prolong. We're trying to find another way uh, where we can still probably complete the project as soon as we can. Um, mm. The Baines project, that's a hydro uh, power project that uh, is be, has been conceived between Namibia and Angola. Um, it's a project that has potential to uh, uh, deliver about uh, 600 megawatts of, of power. Uh, we are still at the phase where we are doing feasibility study of the project. Uh, there was preliminary feasibility study done, and that has been completed. It, it did show some good signs of it can be done. Um, but again, I think we have set ourselves a deadline to say by June of this year, we we're supposed to actually to make a decision uh, how we are going to proceed in terms of the actual uh, construction of, of the project. So mm -hmm. that, that still has got a very, very positive uh, prospect for us actually to start having that. Um, project being developed between the two governments uh, as neighboring countries. So th that's, that's really where we are with regard to those um, uh, three projects. Thank you, Minister. Um, we are reaching the end of our session. However, there is a hot topic which has been coming up on the, on the Q&A box quite a lot, and that is nuclear power. Um, we heard in 2018 that Namibia has a, a, an interest in, uh, in generating power from, uh, from nuclear. Uh, what is Namibia's current appetite for nuclear power generation, both for internal consumption and uh, potential exports to SADC countries. Yeah. Um, yes, I think, I, and I knew it was going to come up. You know, the argument goes like, well, Namibia, you know, is the fourth largest uranium production country, and therefore we should necessarily therefore have nuclear you know, uh, energy. Mm. Uh, Although I don't really think that's the right way to look at it, uh, just because we are the producer of, um, of uh, uranium does not necessarily make you a candidate for uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear, nuclear energy. In our long-term development plan, um, we do have a, a possibility of actually having, uh, having a, a mix uh, consisting of um, um, uh, nuclear energy, but where we are today, we have not actually taken a firm decision to say we are going to do that. Uh, and I think with time, you know, as, as we go on, uh, obviously technology is improving and, 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 and things are happening uh, to the extent that as a minister of, 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 of the 24 energy, obviously the energy I want to, you know, to produce is the energy that is more affordable for the ability to become an issue and therefore um, by the time we now really seriously consider the energy we're going to have to put that together with all the other sources and say 
Is that something which you can do? And of course, you, we all know the complications of, uh, of nuclear energy and the kind of regimen that you need to follow to be able to do that. Uh, so it's not really as straightforward as other sources like the fossil fuel or the renewable energy. But certainly in our long-term development plan, there are provisions of us looking at that, except for right now, we have not taken a firm decision to say, yes, we are going to go that, having to follow this kind of a program. Thank you, Minister. That, that's, that, that's excellent. But um, uh, one last question for NJ before we wrap up. Um, NJ, we have, um, we have a political agenda that's going towards, um, that's running, that, that's running a conversation around renewables and why Africa should not invest or exploit fully to its full potential um, in renewable energy. Um, of course, on one side, we have the idea that yes, there's an issue of climate change, but on the other side, we have an issue of African countries need to exploit their resources so that they could benefit the same way how um, this narrative, how countries in this, that are pushing this narrative are, have benefited. What is your take on that? And how should African countries approach the, the energy transition when they are making policy? Let's go with that. I, I, think, uh, I think the minister, he um, gave a very, very good answer to, this, um, to that question in his uh, previous uh, response. And more specifically, I think anybody who denies or who argues that climate change is global warming um, mm -hmm. is a problem, is a fool. It is a problem. Mm -hmm. And we all have to look at finding common solutions towards a problem that is going to cre create grave issues on, on the planet Earth. I think mm -hmm. as Africans, again, we get, have to get back to that energy mix. The real issue which you have to be focused on is saying, how do you incentivize renewable? How mm -hmm. do you incentivize the creation of that new industry which a country like Namibia has already laid out a, a, a platform for that to happen? And it's, as the minister said, 30% of, of uh, the, the, the energy in the country already dealing with, uh, altern with alternative energy outside of hydro, of hydro. Now, around Africa, you m maybe it's a good place to start and, start and start looking at and seeing how this works. Energy transition, it's real. The question you have mm -hmm. to ask yourself is, how do you play? How do young people play in this? Are we going to use some of your technology hubs whether in, in Namibia or in Cape Town or in Boya or in Dakar, Senegal, and really play it and really be ahead of the game and leapfrog to the future. The real questions you've got to start really dealing with right now is, do you go to the minister and say, minister, in order for us to do this and bring these new technologies and do this, we will need you to advocate for us these incentives and these fiscal terms to make it really, really commercial so we can do that. So it's not an issue of either or. I think all sorts of, all kinds of energy, as long as they are safe, they should be part of that energy mix and we should really get And one of the key issues that we, uh, Gary, we need to be very careful as Africans is to depoliticize this. I don't believe, for me, I, again, I'm the kid who, I'm hungry, I want food. I don't pay attention to politicizing the development of our people. We should not do that because what works to develop our people should be done and we have to be above politics and we need to work with our brothers and sisters in the West, doesn't matter where they come from, but also we need to really see how we could use those development institutions or financial institutions, but also you have to make a forceful case on why your development needs to go a certain way 
while reconciling that with global agreements and global incentives. So it's up to you to get out there and create those technologies, create those businesses. And if this is an area of disruption, you want to be ahead of it. I don't want to see that if there is going to be the next billionaire for clean energy, it should come out of Namibia or not even Namibia, it should come out of Tura. Okay, it should come the next billionaire come out of Tura. That is what my job is, you know, and I think my job is going to the minister and say, can I get the right kind of policies or fiscal um, terms or fiscal framework to make sure that a kid in Tura can use some Namibian ingenuity and take us to the future. Or that investor, that oil company that wants to really drill and develop its, whether it's gas or oil or refineries, that they are they continue to be welcome. And the minister mentioned before, you still rank very high when it comes to doing business rankings with the World Bank. That's something that Namibia has that a lot of countries don't have. And you should be proud of that. And you should take advantage of that and don't stop there, but leverage that and go to the next. But also, you know, one thing we don't have to look at doing is do, do what some other countries have done, have a discovery then take a very long time to approve that. I would say mm. Ghana and Uganda discovered oil at the same time, but Ghana started producing three years later. Uganda just approved, um, it's at the process of approving the FID. It's a little bit late, but we welcome it. And we hope that in the future, when Namibia discovers oil, the approvals will go faster so that the industry can move fast and they can meet the development needs of the people and also the investors as well. Mm. well Honorable Minister, um, what are your last words in this conversation? So what do you think the future of the Namibian um, energy industry should be? And how, would you, how are you going to design that future for the Namibian people, um, incorporating, of course, the whole idea of the African continent? I think the, the, um, the, the future of the Namibian energy sector, I think, is, is bright. As I say, you know, they, 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 they are very positive and encouraging signs when we talk about the, uh, the hydrocarbons, as I was just saying, we had a couple of investors that are really, really keen, interested in actually finding, you know, finding something. On the renewable, we have got a lot of uh, going because, you know, over the years we were able actually to do some, to introduce some reforms that make it possible for uh, independent power producers to come into, uh, into the sector and actually produce renewable energy, especially solar and, and wind. That is going forward. And that's why I think that figure of 30% of solar and wind is actually increasing. It's great. Uh, and all coming from the private sector investment. We will continue to do that. Uh, but for me, again, all of us, you know, whether or not as, as government minister or the investors, I think let's all agree that, you know, at the end of the day, what are we doing all these things for? What is it what are we doing for? Surely we are doing that because we simply also want to have to, in, you know, to make it, you know, for people to live, human beings to live. And therefore, whatever it is we are doing, whether in terms of the policy provision or in terms of investment, it should really be impactful to the human beings. People who are trying to save, and those human beings must actually feel, you know, something is, you know, the, what we are doing is, it has a positive impact on their lives. Uh, and therefore, coming back again to that dialogue that we need to have uh, between all the parties, in that dialogue, let's just remember that there are already people behind uh, some of these numbers we're talking about, uh, that they are looking at us as governments, as investors to say, what do we get out of this? What is, what is in for us? And therefore, um, I, I, it's certainly a, 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 a bright future, I think, when, when we look at what is, what is possible and what is on the ground. Uh, and uh, as, as a minister and as a government, obviously, we will continue to engage uh, the investors. Um, the only thing we will continue to ask the, for the investors to say, let's just make sure that what is, we are, we're going to agree it should really be mutually beneficial between the investors and, and the investing in the, in the Namibian people. And for that, uh, we, we, we continue to invite the investors to come uh, invest in our sectors.
Thank you so much, Minister. Uh, thank you, NJ. We have reached the end of, the, of this webinar. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Javi, for the, for the moderating and the great questions. Thanks a lot to a very strong audience and uh, the good Q&A. Um, you will be able to find this video on our YouTube channel. Please visit aopwebinars.com. Uh, we have a webinar Monday on Angola coming up, which will be uh, very interesting. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good end to your day. Thank you very much, NJ. Thank well. you. It's an honor, Minister. Thank you so much. See you back in Tura. And this time, I'll Once the you. lockdown is over, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> All the Thank, best. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.